Uh, welcome to uh, this fourth uh, breakout session. I'm John Gettinger. I'm the SVP of Marketing at RIA Systems. And with me today, we've got uh, one of my colleagues, Paul Henderson, who's our CFO of our company. And uh, also a special guest, Bob Harden, the uh, we're able to secure, uh, Bob, I'm sorry, Bob Harden from Experian, uh, who's the uh, Senior Director of uh, Building Operations, they're building software operations for Experian, and an RIA customer. And um, we were able to secure Bob's participation in the last couple of weeks, so we changed the agenda a little bit. And I hope uh, it's a little different than what's in the program. I hope you guys won't mind hearing a, hearing a success story rather than a marketing guy talking about his product. So I thought that would be a little more interesting. Uh, but before we get started, I want to tell you a few things about Aria. Uh, we're a Silicon Valley company, uh, founded in 2007. I'm sorry, not founded, we were funded in 2007. We actually were around for a few years before that and launched the company in 2007. Uh, we're uh, headquartered in San Francisco, VC back company, Interwest, and uh, Hummer Winblad, um, a couple other guys involved in the company, and you can of course go to our website to learn more about the business. I'm not going to spend a bunch of time talking about the product, I'm going to really let uh, uh, what Bob's experience and experience and what he did with uh, Aria there really, really tell the story of what we're doing. But I will tell you that we, uh, we've been around for a while, we've had a lot of, a lot of success in the market. Um, uh, not as well known as we'd like to be, but uh, definitely have some great names there. Um, recent success included Blackberry and, uh, uh, of course, uh, Mosey, Salon.com, a lot of great customers. So before, I'm going to just go into the regular part of the presentation here. So how, how many people here are, are involved with recurring revenue business today? Okay. And, and how many are considering it, uh, considering doing something in that area, in recurring revenue? Okay, good. So, so most of the people here. So, you know, I probably don't have to tell all of you that, uh, you know, that, that recurring revenue as a business model is more than just a fad. It's actually uh, a, a trend that's sweeping uh, across the entire business community, large businesses, small businesses, all sorts of businesses are experimenting with recurring revenue. Um, and last, uh, one of the interesting stats I like to throw out is that, uh, uh, according to Parker, 47% of businesses today have adopted or are considering adopting or recurring revenue business. So it's something, you know, if you're not, uh, up to date on, on what it's all about. It's something I encourage all of you to learn more about because it's probably, you know, at some point in your careers is something you're going to bump into. And, and so understanding it is, uh, is, uh, is important. It's a, it's a different way of doing business than, uh, than what's out there today. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, it's different. It's different because of two reasons. One is you've got an ongoing relationship with the customer. And there's also a, 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 a kind of a different business model. We, we think about it in this way. Uh, there's this idea of user entitlement, which is what does a user uh, actually have uh, entitled to have in terms of the business relationship? And we define it as really four elements. Uh, what's the product offering? Is it a premium, limited time, pay as you go? Um, what's the channel model that you're operating under? Do you direct? Do you sell through, uh, you know, through indirect channels? Are you doing line of business? Uh, what's the uh, contract that you have with your customer? What are the terms? Are there penalties involved? In, for example, is there a cancellation penalty? Um, is there an amortization schedule? You know, all those elements that make up a contract. And then finally, what's, uh, what's your monetization strategy? So, you know, a lot of people think of recurring revenue as like, well, I'm just going to charge your credit card every month. It's actually a lot more than that. So, you know, those are the elements that we look at when we think about what's, a, what's your monetization strategy when we ask people that. That, that's how we, how we split it up. Uh, so before I um, introduce Bob, I'll just tell you a little bit. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm going to introduce Bob now. So Bob's with Experian, and uh, he's got a great story to tell about uh, his experience with the Aria and his, the process and, and some of the problems and challenges they had to tackle with the product. So I'll take it away, Bob. Okay. <coughs> I think that's better, right? So, to, to start this out today, I, I need to tell you I'm an IT guy, I'm not a finance guy. Uh, started my career as an assembler language programmer. If you don't know what that is, think uh, Sheldon and Leonard and the Big Bang Theory, take away the PhDs, uh, and, and what you have left are assembler language programmers. And I, I like to think I'm not really one of those guys, but I worked with a lot of those guys early in my career. Uh, and I've had an opportunity to, to go through a a lot of stages, most recently managing uh, billing software for Experian. Just as a little bit of background, and I think a lot of you in the finance community are familiar with Experian, uh, multinational company, uh, 
uh, we help you acquire new customers and then manage the risk of your financial transactions with those customers. Uh, four and a half billion dollars, uh, we don't want to be four and a half billion dollars for very long. We want to be five billion and six billion and seven billion and ten billion uh, over the next few years. So, so we're trying to grow. And that growth is through both acquisition and through the startup of new businesses and new product lines. Uh, we're in 44 countries as of the time the slide was produced. Um, that won't be accurate for very long. And in that context, okay. there we go, user error. I can write the code, they don't, they're not that good at using the products. So, at Experian, we're trying to grow through new business opportunities. Uh, it's not that long ago that I was called into the office of one of our senior VPs from product development and, and a couple of uh, product directors uh, and given a challenge, basically, uh, for my team, which consists of a few SMEs and some project people. Experian wanted to expand the business. And we wanted to expand into new markets, uh, specifically one that we recently announced uh, the, the startup of a new credit bureau in Australia. Uh, that, that process, um, well, I, mean, I can't tell you how long it was in the making. It's taken us a while to get there, but we've opened a new credit bureau in Australia. We're also looking at expanding operations in, in existing markets, offering new products, new product lines in existing markets uh, in a BNA pack. Uh, so we were given this challenge. We're going to start up. We're going to start a new business. Start from scratch in Australia. Uh, a new, a new credit bureau business. Well, okay. So as the IT guy who's who's in the room because I'm going to be asked to su supply the systems and specifically a, a billing system to support this business, I have a few questions like what products, which which of our product lines, uh, which of our existing products are we going to offer. And how are we going to offer those offers? What are the monetization models? And the answer that we got that day was, well, when we know, we'll tell you. But go find us a system to support this. The constraints were that we, we also have existing business in some of these markets that we're expanding into. Now we're going to develop uh, new product line, new product offerings, new fulfillment platforms. Again, our business is IT-based. We sell information. So, our assembly line is a, is a group of code programmers sitting in a room writing code. And they're going to build us a new way to deliver our products. And when that is available, we need to be able to build it. But we also need to support existing product lines in some of these existing markets. So that was the challenge that I, that I walked out to the office that day with. And as the IT guy, I, I felt a bit like, like an architect who'd been asked to build a house. And well, how many stories you want, do you want, what's the square footage? Well, start building and we'll let you know. Uh, and, and there's just some basic things that, that you need to know in order to, to, to get a project like this off the ground. So we, we formed a, a cross-functional team, a couple of people from our finance area, a couple of, a couple of guys from my team, uh, subject matter experts in building, uh, a couple of people from the product delivery side. And, and we talked through some of the issues that needed to be decided in order to, to go forward and bring up this new business uh, in Australia. We needed to provide a low cost to serve. So, so new business, looking for a limited startup investment. Uh, we don't want to go out and spend a bazillion dollars buying a big red box of software and 27 servers to put it on. We want a low startup investment. We want to minimize the, the ongoing IT costs. Again, our business model is that the startups tend to, to move slowly and the ramp up kind of looks like this. So that the first year our business might be very close to nothing and then it ramps up. And when it does ramp up, it ramps up very quickly. But to, to support a business like that, we needed lo a low startup cost. We needed to minimize the ongoing IT costs and our finance people needed some certainty around what those costs would be. Uh, we wanted low-touch processes, which means we probably wanted to integrate solutions. We didn't want somebody to have to work in CRM to manage clients and then come over and do the same work in billing to set up clients and then do the same work on our ERP platform to set up those clients. And 
we wanted to, if we could, um, provide an opportunity for a shared services approach, at least within geographic regions. So if we have five businesses operating uh, in Central Europe, is there an opportunity there uh, to, to bring those five countries together into a shared service center back office operations? We wanted a rapid time to market. I don't know how many of you have done billing projects, but, but in the industry, if you go out and buy that big red box of software, it probably takes you six months to get to the decision point to do that. And once you've made that decision, it's a 12 to 18 month uh, process to build. Well, from the time that I was in that meeting, we were told that we needed to have something up and ready for beta testing in nine months. So, so I didn't have time. I mean, you don't have time to go out and buy a big red box and put in all the big servers and, and do all that work. We were looking for a rapid time to market to get started, uh, to get started in Australia, to get started in other new businesses as the opportunities arrive, and also the ability to get to market quickly uh, with, with new products. So we'll start, with, we'll start with one set of products, we'll bring another product on, online six months after the business starts. We need to be able to bring those products on like that. Excuse me. We also wanted to reach unserved or underserved market segments. In, in our business, uh, in the U.S. in our business, there are, there are three main competitors in the credit reporting business and our marketing business, there are three or four competitors. And, and we tend to serve specific marketing segments well. So one of our, one of our competitors is, is better than or has more market share than we do in a certain market, we kind of dominate some other markets. Uh, well, we want to reach out to those underserved or unserved market segments for Experian. And that requires probably the offering of some new products or services, maybe the offer, offering of some new monetization models. And, and we want to do that without having any impact on our existing business. We also want to integrate. Now, go back to the, that first slide, and we're in 44 countries. A lot of those countries we've gone into by acquisition. The end result of that is that we own Siebel on-premise CRM, Oracle CRM on-demand, Salesforce, Microsoft Dynamics, Sage, and probably about seven other CRM platforms. Well, we want CRM to integrate with whatever we wind up doing on the billing side. We also want to integrate with the ERP platform. On the ERP platform, we have the big red box for an Oracle ERP, release 12, a single global instance, single global chart of accounts. Uh, that's a, probably the topic for a whole different seminar. Uh, it's the bloodiest project I've ever been involved in. Um, we didn't want to leave money on the table. And, and the, this are not really an IT issue, but, but as the IT guy, I need to provide a system that so, will support this. So we need the right products for the right <coughs> markets. We need the right monetization models. Uh, we probably need to look outside the box. We're, we're a recurring revenue business, uh, a big portion of our business. Part of our business is more of a, uh, of a widget, uh, order, produce something, send it out the door type of business. But our bread and butter business is recurring usage uh, and usage-based models, but we, we probably need to think outside the box on how to monetize our products. We, we need, if we're going to go to a different mod monetization model, like a subscription model, we need to think about how to price it. Um, and think about, you know, my son's a great example for this. My, my son has an iPhone with AT&T under one of the old contracts. So, so I'm paying 40 bucks a month for three gig of data. He pays 35 bucks a month on a legacy contract on unlimited data. He downloaded, he went through 13 gig of data last month. So how much money did AT&T leave on the table uh, on, on his contract? Uh, and how much did he abuse uh, his ability to download data? Well, we don't want to give our customers the opportunity uh, to uh, use our products that way. Uh, we want to make sure that we're not leaving money on the table. Um, we want to provide upsell, cross-sell opportunities, reduce churn, uh, identify the, the right revenue recognition rules for how we're going to offer these products. And we want to capture relationships, not orders. And I think this is a really important piece for us. Um, we, want to, we want to maintain long-term relationships with our clients. 
maximizing customer value over time. And a lot of time that requires providing clients with the, the foot in the door type of opportunities. So one of the things the business was looking to me for was to provide a, a solution that would allow them to, to offer promotional offers, uh, time, time limited offers, uh, the, the ability to bring new clients in and get them started on a product and then upsell uh, to, to a more profitable plan. So we went out and looked at the market. We looked, we, we hired a consulting firm that we worked with for a long time on revenue projects to go do an initial product search. And one of the things our CIO asked us to do, um, which we wound up doing a bit skeptically, was look at cloud-based solutions. Um, we knew that, that there were several vendors that were offering some subscription type offerings, subscription type building in the cloud. Um, we were a very heavily usage-based business. I think we were a little skeptical that we'd find what we wanted, but we'd just been through the, the, the Oracle project, this, this bloody um, project. We're still, still bruised. A lot of people were still wearing bandages. And one of the things our CIO asked us to do was to take a look and see whether there was an opportunity to, to farm this out and rather, rather than bringing in software, and going through another one of those types of deployments uh, that close on the back end of our Oracle deployment. Is there an opportunity to do this in the cloud? Is there a vendor out there that can help us? Um, we looked at, at several, and, and what, you'll, what you'll find if you take a look at this market, when we were looking, there were probably, there were probably three vendors that, that we stopped and took a look at. If we, if we were gonna turn around and do this today, there might be four or five. Tomorrow, there might be six or seven. This is an area that's growing um, incredibly quickly um, and, and we were actually surprised I have to tell you I, I didn't believe we'd find a cloud-based solution that would meet our needs um, we actually we actually found one that we were pretty comfortable with there were a few pieces of functionality that that at the time we thought we needed that that uh, the solution wouldn't provide and we found a vendor who would work with us and provide those and, and ultimately build out their product uh, to have a better product at the end of the project that when they started with. So we found a vendor to work with. Obviously, you know who that is um, because you know who's sponsoring this event. Um, you do the same search, your results may vary. But if you're looking at a billing opportunity, I, I think you do your, your, your shareholders a disservice if you don't at least take a look at a cloud-based type of opportunity for billing. Um, we also are standardizing on a CRM solution. Right now, it's Oracle On Demand. Um, because that was our, our global standard. While well, we had 17 different solutions in-house, the one that we were trying to standardize on was on-demand. We wound up integrating those two using a tool from Dell called Boomi um, that, that provides connectors that makes it very easy uh, to link one system to another system. And actually, instead of having uh, an assembler geek like me write this much code, it becomes a point-and-click operation. So we integrated with Oracle ERP. We had very very strong uh, integration tools already in place for our Oracle environment. Um, you know, we still have the scars we got putting some of those in place. We integrated with that environment. We're, we're looking at recurring revenue models wherever possible. Uh, and I have to tell you, I'm, I'm the IT guy, I'm not the finance guy. I'm a little surprised at, at what we're doing with subscriptions. Um, and that's all I can tell you. Anything more than that would be proprietary. I'm surprised that some of the customers and some of the product lines that we're able to sell um, that have been sold primarily as orders uh, that are being as single orders that are now being sold on a subscription basis. Uh, it's a, it was a surprise to me. So we're using subscription. We're hedging our bets. Uh, and, and if you go this direction, this may be something you want to do. Like we're, we're using the, the telco um, phone model, and that is you know, your 700 minutes and then charge for individual minutes beyond that, the subscription with overages. Uh, we, we have several of those types of models in place. We've added that to the toolkit. So our, our salespeople now, in addition to being able to sell traditional usage-based contracts, are able to, to sell subscriptions. 
either straight subscriptions or subscriptions with overage. Uh, we try to make those subscription contracts as long as possible to reduce churn. Uh, I think there's a belief uh, in our business that if we can get in the door and, and get you using our products, you'll keep using our products and they'll become an integral part of your business. So we also have usage. We look at prepaid where practical. Remember one of the notes was to try to uh, reduce the touches to, to limit the amount of work done in our back offices. Uh, we have a back office in one country, um, one of the nicest people I've ever met, but she's growing old before her time because she's responsible for accounts receivable, new contracts, setting up clients, setting up products, uh, and we're running very small tight back office operations. One of the ways to, to help make that practical is to use prepaid. Uh, if you have a small client, and, and, and in, in our case, on a subscription basis, we have a small client, our client acquisition costs are high, our cost to serve if we're working on a usage basis is fairly high, um, but if we get that client on a, on a prepaid subscription, uh, then that back office person it's hands off, you set it up once and turn it on and let it go. And then we have the flexibility to provide promotional offers. So what did we get out of that, the benefits? Um, cost benefits. And, and, and these are significant. Uh, I didn't have to go to the CFO and say, hey, you need to go, we need to go buy X number of servers and X Oracle database licenses, and, uh, and then I have to pay the maintenance on those every year. Uh, we didn't have that upfront hardware, software, deployment cost. We have predictable ongoing costs. We have a subscription relationship with these guys that's based on our usage, um, which, is, which is kind of the standard in this industry. There are, there are multiple metrics that, that these companies uh, look at, at charging you for, find the one that works best for you. Um, we have one that works for us. And we know that the, the only time the cost is going up is if we acquire more customers. Uh, and costs should go up if you acquire more customers, and that's the only time it should go up. Predictable ongoing costs. I don't have to go next year to the CFO and say, you know what, Oracle's telling me if we don't upgrade from 11 G database 11 G to 12 C, uh, we're going to go on sustaining support. Our support costs are going to rise. We're gonna, they're they're going to stop providing patches for our system. So. I know this wasn't in the budget, but I need you to write me a check for X dollars. So, so in, instead, I have a vendor that's taking that risk. Uh, I have a vendor that's responsible for that. Um, we share that technology risk with the vendor. Right? I mean, I think for us, that may be that may be the biggest piece of this. The vendor manages the technology; we manage the business. So, remember, we're an IT business. Uh, our IT guys are building new products, not managing the billing system. Improved time to market, initial ramp up. Um, we took some time on, on this, this first ramp up, and we worked with the vendor. We worked with them on some, actually, some improvements in, in uh, specific pieces of functionality in their, in their product that made it more usable for us. Um, we have a model now in place that we think we can ramp up pretty quickly for new business, uh, and, and we can bring new product services plans on board like that. Uh, finance guys don't even need to call us, although they still do. Um, there is a bit of a learning curve, and my guys are available, but, but when somebody wants a new price plan, a new product, we're not coding anything. We're, we're just making sure, um, we're, we're sitting by their side and, and making sure they do the data entry. Um, that they're getting what they want. And eventually they'll be the experts in that, not us. Uh, we have a repeatable solution, we think we can do it over and over, and the vendor's responsible for the scalability. Uh, they're responsible for maintaining that hardware and, and software, and making sure that when I bring 10,000 customers new on, that they have the capacity to support that. When we get to the end of a project like this, and, and you do this too. You, you stop and, 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 and take a little time out and you know, what did I learn from doing this? And, and 
And what is, how does that fit in with the, the body of knowledge that I already have? I can talk, and the reason I, I'm checking my time is I could talk about this slide for a half hour if, and you'd all fall asleep. But there are some, some things we've learned and I think they held true in this project. Uh, we've, done, we've done a big box project in one of our large markets and we've done some smaller box software projects in a couple of smaller markets. Uh, we, we've now done a, a SaaS project. Um, we've, We've worked through case studies from similar types of businesses, and I think we have five keys, actually maybe it's six, because the first one's in the title. And that is that if you're moving from, from order based to a recurring type of revenue, if you're going from selling widgets uh, one at a time, you get an order, you fulfill the order, to, to dealing with subscription or, or dealing with billing on some kind of recurring basis. That's a business transformation. It's not just a software project. It needs to start with a business strategy. You don't want me going out looking for the system first. Uh, so, so, ah, I just lost it. And we're back. Whatever you did, it worked. Well, we're not that bad. No, we're not that bad there yet. So while he's getting this, I'm going to talk about the first couple of points that were on that slide. The first point, the first point is it's, it's strategy first. You start with the business strategy. What does it want to accomplish as a business? Uh, the IT guys want to go out and buy the sexiest new system. Uh, and I mean, that's, that's what we do. Uh, we, that's, that's how we get excited. You know, Sheldon Leonard want to have whatever's, whatever's cool and new. So, so we want to go buy the sexy new stuff. You guys need to have a business strategy in place. On this project, actually, our strategy is still evolving. And as IT guys leading, leading this cross-functional team, we actually wound up making some assumptions. Some of those assumptions were spot on. I mean, just spot on. Some of them caused us a little bit of rework later on because we weren't quite on track. So the better job you can do of defining your business strategy, the better job your IT guys are going to do of providing systems to meet that strategy. Um, second is that that strategy should be client-centric. Uh, you should really be focused on client. The most successful projects in this area that, that I've seen over time have started with a strategy that's around um, providing the, the, the best possible experience for your client. Um, the third point on that slide, as John tries to bring it up, is, is that you need executive buy-in. Especially if you're a company like us, it's a multinational company with lots of individual business units. Um, I come up with a strategy, I have a global person that's supposed to be responsible for this globally, and the first country business that we go out to wants to do something differently. And they don't want to do it differently because it's statutorily required or, or because their business has to operate that way. They want to do it because that's the way they've done it. And, and in, order to, in order to get around that and successfully do something repeatedly in multiple locations, multiple operating units, multiple business units, you need executive buy-in. Uh, there's a, a, a bank here in the U.S., multinational corporation. Um, everybody would recognize their name and pre presented a case study at, at Open World last fall. And, and one of the things that came out in that case study is they're replacing billing systems in their transactional business in 67 different countries. And if you want to do something differently from the way it's done, uh, you need CFO to buy off on it. You need that level of support. Uh, the fourth point is once you have that strategy, once you get a client centered approach and an executive buy in, you need to find out of the box technology that supports that. Uh, eliminate the C word, no customization. If you need to do customization, and we did some on our project but we did it outside the core product. Um, so we used, we used some standard out-of-the-box functionality uh, that exists within ARIA 
uh, to interface with a small piece of code that we wrote to do, to do a specific function that, that we needed that's not a part of the core product. So the customization we built, we own, it's, it's outside the core product. And, and, and the fifth point was measure success. And we're going to get it up here. As I finish the slide, we're going to get it up there. Uh, and, and by measuring success and, and having ongoing measurements of success, um, you know, we, in the IT side, we tend to think of success as, ooh, my uptime was 99.9%, or I had five nines uptime. Um, I've been successful. For you as a business, that's, you want that measurement, you want that metric, but your measurement of success is how well you're doing in implementing your business strategy. And you need to come up with metrics, KPIs, that measure the success of your business strategy, not the success of your IT guys and keeping your systems running. Uh, and and, and any, any vendor in this market space is keeping their systems running, um, that's not your measurement of success. I, I could talk about this for a long time, but I wanted to turn it over to, to Paul Anderson, who I think wants to talk a little bit about the recurring revenue model. Thanks, Bob. Uh, so, the, uh, my name is Paul Anderson, I'm the VP of Finance uh, at ARIA. Um, as you've heard from Bob, it's a pretty complex process to go through and evaluate and you need to support your recurring, recurring business model from a billing perspective. And I can also tell you from personal experience, managing billing operations at companies like Yahoo and Success Factors is a complicated process. Um, there are quite a few considerations um, that you need to go through, and we've put this little uh, model together that kind of guides us through the decision process. Um, some of the things that you really need to think about are you know, how complicated is your, is your dunning process, for instance, how many, how many different uh, stops do you have in that. Um, you need to think about uh, uh, you need to think about um, how you're going to prorate, what are your proration rules, um, uh, how your um, How many systems you need to integrate with? Um, and I think, um, as a finance person, the uh, the biggest thing you need to get out of your system are the core metrics from your from your business and how your business is running. Um, and and so you need when you're evaluating the system, the most important one of the most important things is what kind of what kind of metrics are you going to be able to get about get out of it about how well your system is running. And uh, I guess with that, we'll turn it over to. Hi. Hey, thanks, Paul. Bob. That was really great. Um, questions? Ready to take any questions? No? Thoughts? Well, yeah, I, I, I have one. Um, I mean, most of the focus here has been on uh, tracking and reporting. Um, but I'm, um, I'm wondering if you can also provide some guidance on of some of the, the analytical processes that you know companies that are thinking about going on to a recurring <coughs> revenue model might uh, might consider. I mean, for example, um, you know, I'm a dinosaur. I still subscribe to the dead tree version of the newspaper. But um, you know that, of course, is um, you know I ain't going to be doing that. You know, Few years from now, sure. and you know, organizations like like the San Francisco Chronicle are thinking about you know what they can do differently. So, do you have some uh, you know tools that could allow them to you know test out different approaches, you know test the waters, and you know evaluate uh, you know what approach would be most beneficial so they wouldn't be you know leaving money on the table and other yeah. things. Well, thank you for that that great uh, question because uh, that is actually something. Uh, that I think is a big consideration is it's not actually a financial consideration, but it's a business consideration, which is, you know, for many of the businesses, how, how many businesses here are sort of in the, still in the startup stage or early, yeah, getting a business? So yeah, so experimentation of, of your and exploration of your market is definitely a, a big consideration <coughs> and, you know, the ability to, uh, you know, set up and, and test strategies and different pricing and packaging strategies is a key part of that. and. Um, 
you know, in terms of metrics, I don't know, Paul, if you have any thoughts on it, but definitely, I think it's a consideration in any product, and certainly in ours too, is how, how quickly can you, uh, can you make changes in your product, uh, your product catalog, and how quickly can you introduce new pricing concepts in there. So that's one element of it. And then the other is, how, how do you know things are working, and what kind of data support and, and information does the system provide you to understand what, you know, how your strategy is actually working in the market. And, uh, and I think for certain businesses is a key consideration because you've got you've got to have that that agility to be able to, to evolve your product and your business to the point that uh, that, that that it's successful. And a, and a recurring revenue stream is a whole different set of metrics than a traditional business. Yeah. So things like you know monthly recurring revenue and being able to manage your business to minimize your churn, maximize your renewal rates, and, and have that information available um, is very important in the system. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a whole, you know, after after the thing, I can definitely point you some resources. I mean, you could have a whole, you could have an hour session just on the measurements and the KPIs in your business that you want to uh, you want to uh, focus on because they're they're very different than an order based business for sure. And so, um, you know, uh, so that's a whole other session. But definitely, I can point you some resources where there's uh, there's some stuff online where you can start to, to understand more about that. And yeah, I think one of the, excuse me, one of the analytics we really want to take a look at is is how your pricing affects uh, customer renewal. Uh, Salesforce has done a lot of work with this and, and, and identified specifically that if, that if they, they price at one level, uh, they get X amount of subscriptions and, and there's, there's an optimal price below, below that price, they're leaving money on the table. Above that price, customers are walking away. So th that's, that's the kind of analytic that you're looking at doing. Yes. That, that, that's what you need to be able to do. Yeah, and I think the consideration any system you purchase is how, how easy or hard is that to, uh, to affect in, the, in, a, in a building operation in a system like ours. Yeah, and, and you know, to, to me there's, there's sort of two components to that. You know, one is the, the tracking and reporting, and the other is, is the projecting. Mm -hmm. And you know, I don't need to remind this group you know, how, how difficult it is to, to integrate those two processes. Yeah, if, if you have sort of a blend of, you know, one-time transaction offerings plus ongoing subscription offerings, do you need two separate billing systems or can you do it with one? Uh, well, I don't know. Maybe it's a question for Bob, I don't know. Well, we're, we're doing it with one. So, so we do have, the, the, the systems we've looked at in this space are not primarily order management systems. Uh, they're not, but uh, you, you do have you do have the capability to process one-time orders. Um, our our primary business is recurring business. It's usage based. It's sub subscription based. Um, but we do have a portion of our products that we sell on on, on one time on a one-time order basis. And we're doing all three of those things using the one solution in Australia. Yes, sir. If you do renewal promotion where you can give uh, off price off if you renew in advance by two months or one month. Mm -hmm. Let's say twenty dollars off of uh, renewal price twenty dollars. Uh, if you renew sixty days in advance. Mm -hmm. And if you renew only thirty days in advance then you have ten dollars off. Right. And if you can collect data from that, can you predict whether your price is right or not. Do you have any such analytics? Uh, well, yeah, so I didn't want to flog my product here in front of you good people, but, but uh, we, we do have a fully integrated business intelligence system with our it's, it's So we do deep analytics, so it's not just a reporting system, but actually a full BI system where you can run ad hoc reports and you can do analytics and trending and things like that. So I mean, you know, the type of question you're you're asking is a hard one because some of it's just looking at trends and trying to, you know, intersect, look at intersections between different trends and identify opportunities. But but certainly our system supports that kind of activity, and that's one of the things that we built the system for is exactly those kind of scenarios. I think another important consideration is is the ability to set some kind of alerting in that in that situation. Like, uh, you know, there's there's. There's an analytical method and there's heuristical methods, right? And so if you if you can can have the ability in a system to, to test a hypothesis, 
uh, sometimes that, that can be more powerful than just running a set of analytics and trying to you know, formulaically calculate something. And so one of, the, one of the things we offer in our system is we really set thresholds uh, around, around behavior. And so, for example, in, in this type of situation, you could say, well, let's set up an offer. Uh, when we see someone getting to, you know, on a monthly plan as an example, if they get to half their usage, you know, a week into their plan, let's make them an offer to upgrade. And so the ability, and that then lets you test a hypothesis out there, and you can try different scenarios and say, well, what if we you know, offer a discount for him to upgrade early and, and get to the next plan level? But, but I think what, you know, the point I want to make in all this is that you know, one of the considerations we're looking at any system, RA or any of the other you know, systems that are out there today, is you, you know, some of these advanced capabilities that people often don't think about when they think about billing. Because billing is always, you know, hey, I want to run an order through, charge a card, and be done. And, and what, what you're looking for in recurring re revenue is exactly these kind of things, is that you've got to increase, figure out how are we going to increase customer lifetime value over time? And, and what are the different strategies we can run to do that? And, you know, I can't even, be, like I said, there's a whole meeting, you could have a whole, uh, you know, hour meeting to talk about all the strategies that people employ, and people keep coming up with more strategies. But, but if your system doesn't support your ability to make change quickly in the, in the system, uh, if, if every time you have to update the product catalog or, or make changes to a pricing plan, it's a weeks or months long effort, then your ability to experiment is, is, uh, is, is hampered, is, is inhibited by that. So I guess I, I don't that answer your question, but I, but I think it's, uh, you know, these kind of strategies, I, I, I sit here in meetings, everyone's, you know, I think as we all get into this recurring revenue, it's like a brave new world for all of us. And, you know, there's a lot of like, well, what's your strategy for this? And how do you deal with that? And, and, and uh, it would be a great workshop to have just to talk about the different strategies that people are using to make this, to, to, to improve their business. But um, I think that's one of the things you've got to think about in any, any system that you're looking at in, in this market, is how, how their ability to support that kind of activity. Yes? I'm having a hard time kind of visualizing what this product is. Yeah. So is it geared towards, it's basically just a billing it's a billing product geared towards high volume, because it seems like you're a high volume case. Is yeah. that where it would be I, I best think, utilized? I think, yeah, I think versus so. startups per se? Well, it depends. You know, one of the things I've learned being in this business is that you know transactional complexity is not correlated to company size. So, you know, we deal with businesses, sometimes very large businesses can have a very simple transactional uh, model, and sometimes we have customers who are very small businesses that can have, you know, unbelievably complicated uh, uh, transactional models. And so, I think, I think that's a better way to think about so it. So, your sweet spot is more high complexity. The, the, the system deals with high complexity billing situations. I think you have situations, yeah, yeah. Okay. Let, me, let me finish, but, uh, but yeah, so you've got situations where you know, the need for agility in your business. Uh, we've talked a little bit about that today. You know, how, how quickly can you make changes? I think, you know, there's an issue about systems leverage. If you're like Bob and Experian, where you have, you know, substantial investment in other systems and you need a solution that's going to really work in that context, you can't rip and replace and you can't, uh, you, you don't want to extend, you know, the, 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 and I think the other part that Ari is really good at is really, you know, maintaining a, a, a really, excellent customer experience in, in the face of a lot of stuff going on in the back end. If you look at some of our customers where you've got, uh, you know, a lot, of a lot of business complexity going on, where you may be talking to four or five different systems trying to uh, mediate, a, you know, an event to happen for the customer, you don't want to expose your customer to that. You know, like I think about, you know, one of our customers, Mosey, you know, and if you think about that Mosey experience of, you know, downloading, you swipe your card, you download a widget, and three minutes later you're backing up your system. And if you think about what has to happen on the back end and make that experience happen for the customer, uh, there's a lot. You know, you've got to go find a rack and find some storage and set up an account and run the card, and all that has to happen in the space of a few minutes to, to create that really, really great customer experience that makes Mosey, you know, so, such an awesome product. And so I think, you know, in those types of systems, that's where you get beyond just a simple billing system into something that's, that's, that's a lot more like what we look like. Yeah, and, and John, let me throw in one comment here. Uh, Experience a well-established business. We've been around for a long time. Uh, but our business in Australia, where we specifically deployed this first, is a startup. And it's a new business startup for us. Um, and using uh, a new product delivery platform uh, new products, uh, new ways of, of getting those products to our customers. Thanks, Bob. Yes, ma'am. 
You guys are obviously integrating with Oracle well. What other ERPs are you integrating with, and what are the ERPs platform opinion of sort of your software? Are they, are they being agnostic? Because I think Bob mentioned there's at least five or six other alternatives out. Mm -hmm. How are they viewing this as a, as a niche? Uh, well, we, we today we have uh, we, inter we interface with NetSuite, um, Oracle, and SAP, and uh, we've got a bunch. And we we like a lot of companies use a connector strategy, so we have you know we can connect to a bunch of other systems as well. But the ones that we really really own those connections is, is those three today. And you know, in terms of vendor, um, you know these other vendors, I I think Oracle has been a fantastic partner. And uh, you know we've done we've done some co-marketing work with them and stuff, and you know they've been pretty accepting of this uh, so far. I mean you know you never know in the market, but certainly you know I think one of the challenges that all these companies have is that their these old billing systems are not designed for these types of scenarios we've been talking about about these agility and and some of these other business scenarios. And so you know so far they've been fantastic partners for us and SAP as well, and uh, you know they they've been very very good about integrating. Uh, do you integrate with any sales commissions? One of the frustrations of recurring revenue is that you can commission them in many different ways. Uh, some on annuity basis, some on breaking, paying out, etc. And uh, just one of the complexities. That, uh, oh, only through connectors. I mean, you know, if you today there's a you know all of us in the SaaS business have been using these uh, connector strategies like um, uh, Cloud Connect and um, SnapLogic and Boomi, of course. Where you know we all publish sort of our APIs to these connectors, and then you you can buy these connectors, and they guarantee a certain amount of interconnectivity between the products. And so today, that's how we connect with them. But we haven't we haven't been looking at that space. But it's probably something we should be looking at. Any more questions? Good questions here. Okay. Well, great. Thank thank you everybody for. Uh, <laughs> <laughs>